God bless you. The Lord is good. And all the times. I think you can do better than that. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Thank you so much. Uh, there was a girl that was telling the children's story. I don't know where she's gone to. She was standing somewhere here. And I could tell she was a little bit tensed. But there was a teacher just next to her. Where is that teacher? Also disappeared. But thank you for that kind of support you were giving her. Just rubbing her back to release the tension as she preaches to the children. Every speaker has some sort of a stage fright. Also, I'm experiencing one. I wish there was someone here to rub my back. I have been uh, in constant communication with the two ladies. That should be Sister Sally and Sister Achien. Are they here? That is who? That is Sally. Where is Achien? A chien, a chien. Ah, lovely ladies. They ensured that I was here safe, home and dry, and we are here today. God bless you so much. Sister Sally introduced to me Sister A Ching, and she said, she's, someone will call you. She's called Achi. So I was wondering what Achi meant. Eh? So when Achi called, she said, I am a chin. I said, mm. <laughs> In the Lua, we have a word called to dando. So if you want to dando a chin, you say a chi, not a chi. Sister Sally, it is a chi, okay? <laughs> not a chi. Just like I have a daughter called Keruo. We call her Kebi. We have one called Nadia. We call her Nana. That is Tudendo, okay? Then we have one called Nadine. We call her Dindin. So Achieng is what? Not Achi, it is Achi. <laughs> I am honored to speak to you today. I pray that the Lord will bless us. Allow me to ask a few questions as we go through our sermon. What would you do when you are bored beyond belief with life? What would you do when you lose your self-drive, what would you do when the fire in your soul goes out? When you lose your sense of significance and relevance? When you feel like life has become meaningless and you want to quit? What would you do when you are stuck with everything? When you begin a thought process and you cannot complete it. When you choose to have a break and breathe. But you cannot rise again. And amidst all this, your family and relatives, your employer, your community, and above all the universe, and the God of this universe is looking to you 
and they all have high expectations from you. Luke chapter 15 is a parable of the lost ship, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sand. And Christ gives these parables in response to the complaint of the Pharisees and the scribes about him having to receive and sit with sinners and eat with them. And for sure, as you go through the story, the conclusion is he sits with sinners, receives them and eats with them because he came to seek and save the lost. This comes out more clearly in Luke 19 when Christ decides to stay at Zacchaeus' house. But when they saw it, the Bible says, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And in verse 10, Jesus says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. The same thing happens with Matthew Levy in Matthew 9 and Luke 5. Christ saw a tax collector, Levi, and said to him, follow me. Levi then gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. And when the scribes and Pharisees complained why he ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners, Christ responds in Matthew 9 verse 12 and Luke 5, 31 and 32. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Both Matthew Levy and Zacchaeus were tax collectors. In Luke 15 is the same scenario. Allow me to do for you Luke 15 verse 1 and 2. We see the same scenario. The Bible says then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So it's the same scenario. And in answer to their complaint, he gave the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost sand. Beloved, we all know that the parable of the lost sheep represents those who are lost. They know they are lost, but cannot find their way back home. The parable of the lost coin represents those who are lost and they do not even know they are lost. So you can't even think of saying or talking of a home or no hope because they don't even know they're lost. And then the parable of the lost son represents those who are lost, they know they are lost. Good. You keep praying for me. But don't look at me too much. <laughs> for today, we will focus on the parable of the lost coin. Allow me to do with you Luke 15, verse 8 and 9. The Bible says, O oh, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found 
the peace which I lost. My question would be, why was the woman taking the trouble to turn the house upside down in search of only one coin? On Wednesday, just this week on Wednesday, I visited with my aunt in Kindube. I come from Kindube. Yeah. I realized when we were at the vestry, Pastor Nyaga asked me, Kisumu bear. And then Sister Dacha was imagining what I want to answer. Then she said, if only she understands what you have said. Because she knows I am called Elizabeth Mokoro. And my daughter of Rachonyo married in Kisi. I fell in love with a Kisi accent. And you know how lovely it is, is it? Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> my kids are funny. My kids have some words with a very deep Kisi accent. I have a son called Sokoro. Sokoro pronounces Chaja as Chacha. Mami wapi Chacha yako? The other day he was asking me for his jacket. He says, wapi Chaga Tiang? <laughs> and I keep on asking, Sokoro is not Chaga, it is jacket. So say jacket. Say Chaget. <laughs> so on Wednesday I was in Kindube. I was visiting with my aunt who has lost a son. We are buried next week. And while we were seated in the house chatting, a male guest arrived. He had brought some medicine for toothache. And as he pulled it out of his pocket, some coins fell down. He bent to pick them and left one coin, saying he couldn't see where it had rolled to. And he said, it's just a coin. For him, it was just a coin. And particularly the fact that he is a man. Very few men walk with coins. They ever walk with coins, they are put somewhere in the car, is it? Yes. For us women, coins matter. We even have a small pass for them. And we know where to use those coins. For the woman in Luke 15, it was not just a coin. It was drachma. The Greek word for that coin was drachma. A valuable coin often worn in a 10-piece garland by a married woman. In Jesus' time, marriage was very formal and it included many special vows. And during the intricate ceremony, as the young couple would be facing each other, the bridegroom would drop into the capped hands of the bride 10 silver coins. See, when as we stand here and say for better or for worse, and then you drop something here, yeah? Is it? A ring. For them, they would stand facing each other, and the groom would drop 10 silver coins in her hands. As the bride receives these coins, she understands that she is fully purchased. There's no looking left, there's no looking right. You have found your husband. For better, for worse, sickness, or in health, which is the other one. No, some of us didn't do those things. Some of us went to the AG. The other one is what? For richer or poorer. Till death do us what? Of course, not because you killed each other. You died a natural, a natural death. 
and there was no reverse gear. These coins each have a hook attached and they are worn in the hair or on a garland that would go around her head. She will esteem them of great value and guard them with her life because any carelessness on her part would be regarded by her husband as lack of affection and respect for him. If one disappears, it means you didn't respect your husband. If a wife, Christ says, in fact Christ doesn't say wife, Christ says, or oh, what woman, the Greek rendition there is gune, which means wife. Thank you. If a wife loses any of these coins, it breaks the marriage covenant. Spirit of prophecy says this, the wife's marriage portion usually consisted of pieces of money which she carefully preserved as her most cherished possession to be transmitted to her own daughters the loss of one of these pieces would be regarded as a serious calamity and its recovery would cause great rejoicing in which the neighboring women would readily share the book Christ object lesson page 193 paragraph 1 for this woman it was not just a coin it meant her marriage was at stake yes it was only one piece lost but wherever it was lying it was still valuable The message that God has for us today is entitled, Lost but Valuable. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to peruse through the pages of Holy Scriptures. Holy Spirit, speak to each one of us according to the circumstances of our soul. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The young male professionals, I understand, have run a series already on Man Cave. The young professionals of this church. And it focused on the man. The man wounded. The man restored. The man thriving. Wonderful. The young female professionals have also been running a series on dressing room, focusing on the woman dressed, the woman undressed, the woman redressed, and the woman staying dressed. Allow me to say that God does not create for the fun of it. Neither did he create to experiment with us. We were created for a very definite and distinct purpose. All things, and I repeat, all things begin and end with purpose. And everybody lo is looking for some course in life. God is a God of purpose. Everything he created, he did it with a purpose. Everything that exists has a reason for existence. And no matter how insignificant it is, it exists for a distinct purpose in the mind of the creator. The wax in your ears that you keep picking with your pen. You look at some people's, it's called the pen cap or the pen cover. Kifuniko. It's full of wax from the ear. The wax in your ears is there to protect the delicacy of your inner ear. 
The hairs in your nostrils are there to trap bacteria and germs, therefore preventing contamination. If God could think of the minutest details like that, which all have purpose, he sits as he creates and says, I must put some wax here. I must fix some hairs in the nose. If he could think of the minutest details and attach a purpose to it, then how important are you as a human being? God designed everything in life to accomplish something. And he put the ability and the capacity in that thing to fulfill its purpose. Your ability to fulfill your purpose and potential is built into your function and design. You are fully equipped. You are fully dressed with inbuilt abilities. If you want to call them talents, well and good, but you're fully dressed to become who you were born to be. You are equipped. You are dressed with everything you need to fulfill your purpose because God supplies both the potential and the provision to meet every assignment. Neither God nor you will be satisfied until you accomplish that dream in God's heart. Jesus himself is born with a very distinct and definite purpose to save his people from their sins, as Matthew 121 puts it. And when he hangs on the cross finally, he says, it is done what? Finished. Greek says, tetless star. He had accomplished his purpose on us. He came to die for the remission of our sins that we may have eternal life. I wish all of us would die like that. Having emptied yourself of your potential. The business we keep on saying, you know you're full of potential. You know you're full of potential. Now, we need to start, you need to empty yourself of that potential. I call it permanent potential. You keep on saying she's full of potential. Let's try her. She's full of potential. Now bring it out. You will be full of potential until when? I have potential. I have potential. Interestingly enough, God has dressed us with everything we need to become what we were born to be. But watch keenly. Most of us are undressed. And we see this clearly in identity crisis. Who you are is defined by your purpose of existence. The original reason, the original intent, the original cause that brought you into existence. The question would be, do you even know why you're here? Thank God for CBC. It's called curriculum-based, eh? competence-based curricula. Is, is it two? Is it two what? Two, six? Three, three, three? Something like that? Do you get what I'm talking about? Where a teacher has to find out the gifts in a child and guide that child in that direction. My question is, is a very good curriculum. I love it. It's very biblical. My problem is if the mother does not even know what she has given birth to. How do you expect a teacher to know what 50 students in a class are?
I still battle with God. I have five kids. Still battle with God every day. What did I give birth to? Hannah knew what he gave, she gave birth to. Hannah knew. The mother of Samson knew what she gave birth to. And even Mary knew what she gave birth to. How come as women we don't know what we have given birth to? Because the day you find out who you gave birth to, parenting will be easy. Because no one child is raised the same way as the other. You will know I'm raising an engineer. This is a teacher. They are raised differently. They're not raised the same way. You will know you're raising a guard, security guard. So that you stop pushing him into medicine with an A. He's a security guard. So do you even know who you are? Do you know why you're here? Before you even ask about your child, you yourself, who has given birth? Failure to answer this key question results in identity crisis. Where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. For instance, who created tobacco? Let's be sincere now. Who created tobacco? God or Satan? I'm pleading that you answer me. Who created tobacco? Who created marijuana? Bang? Why, why are you saying it like you're not sure? <laughs> I don't know Saturn for creating anything in this world. And when he finished his creation, he said they were good. Hey. He looked at Bang and said, good. <laughs> Tobacco, good. Marijuana, good. But how many people do they kill today? We have lost the reason why God created them. Hence, we abuse them. We experiment with them. We try them. Where purpose is unknown, abuse is inevitable. Having something and not knowing why it exists is dangerous. Most of us do not know why we were born. As such, we have used our life for a wrong reason. And now we feel frustrated. We feel depressed. We feel empty. Because we keep experimenting with our life. Today you went into the university. Daddy said with that A, you must do medicine. Then you went semester one. Said that is hard. So you change into what? People change into what after medicine? Huh? Engineering. Because you have an A. Then you tried engineering. Nothing. Semester, another semester you turned into something else. From engineering is what? Low. Actuarial, whatever. Finally, you landed in hospitality. <laughs> I, I'm not saying those courses are insignificant. I'm only saying you're in the wrong place. You are experimenting with your life. And as you keep experimenting, you're wasting resources, you're wasting time. How many of us are 40 here? They still keep changing jobs. They're still not sure what they're supposed to do. At 40, you should have put your finger on something. There's no looking left. There's no looking right. You're moving at 40. But at 40, you're still wondering who you are. And today many of us go to work because we must pay rent, because we must pay school fees, because we must eat. 
Otherwise, when morning comes, you're like, ah, uh, how soon? Identity crisis has resulted in low self-esteem. We constantly crave for people's approval. Self-esteem is a deep down feeling you have about yourself. The extent to which you think you matter. Today in the morning I look at myself in the mirror. I really took some time. And I say, mm, Lisa, you look good. See with these matutas, they are not ngangas matutas. These are SDA matutas. <laughs> these are not for nano evangelism. No. I say, girl, you look good. So that when I come here, your opinion to me is extra. Yeah, huh? The way I'm dressed like this, that lady will say, I like your outfit. The other one will say, I wish you'd done the dress like this. So who am I supposed to believe? Your opinion doesn't matter to me. And I've told myself that several times. People have had to buy new phones even when they don't need them because they must fit in some group. Identity crisis has forced us into becoming a photocopy of other people's lives. Did you know that your design gives clues to your purpose? Did you know? Your design gives clues to your purpose and potential. The way you are is a clue to why you are. And that is why we have different characters. That is why our attitudes are different. We are different from each other because God created us for different purposes and destinies. We are not the same. Your nose, your mouth, your ears, your eyes. Name it. They are the way they are because of why you are. Ever wondered why I have big eyes? It's because I'm a speaker. I don't need to shout to emphasize. I only need to open them wide. <laughs> and you know we are serious. You cannot be me. I cannot be you. And this includes our complexion. There's a lady I admire. She was seated somewhere here. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's looking at me like this. Yeah. We both come from Sudan, is it? With our dark complexion, we are proud of it. We are tired of people having to lighten their skin. I'm reminding you, your complexion speaks to who you are. Let me tell you something with skin lightening, or you want to call it bleaching. I don't know what you want to call it. The creation of God is so perfect that when you try to tamper with it, there are areas that will never change. No. <laughs> and you know it. Yeah, my sister Zoo want to look mzungu. There are, there are areas that don't turn. Whether you do what, whether you take three doses of skin light, never changes. And God is marvelous and wise. Those areas will always remind you that you are an FBI. <laughs> A former black individual. <laughs> there is no need. There are things in this world you can't change. My, I can't change how my nose looks like, can I? I cannot change my complexion. This is my size. I would want to look a little bit, I used to weigh 48, today thank God I weigh 62. I would want to look bigger, because apparently in Africa, a woman who's well taken care of is big. Even when some of it is not... I don't have a problem with the way I look like. You're the one who has a problem, deal with it. Are, are we together? <laughs> I 
identity crisis has resulted in negative attitude. The feeling of you always can't do it. It's difficult. It's not possible. It's because you're doing what you are not, you are not born to do. You will struggle with that which you have forced yourself to do for the rest of your life. And your attitude will always be negative. Because that is not who you are. That is why I'm saying, if your son is a good security guard, help him through that road. How many security companies do we have today pumping billions into this economy? How many? Several. Today you forced him to be a doctor. He's with you in the house. You're tamaking for him. Friends, identity crisis has made us to succumb easily to negative peer influence. We cannot define our own style. We cannot define our own way of doing things. I love David. David is going to war with the, the big guy. It's called who? Goliath. And Saul calls him and tells him, man, you need to put on these things I put on to the battlefield. And David looks at that and says, okay, let me try. And then he puts on Saul's armor, tries to make a step and he cannot move comfortably and says, uh-uh, I have never tried these things. I have never tested them. And the Bible says he removed them and went to the battle the way he's used to. How many of us, when we are, you know, confronted with peer influence, we are able to say, no, 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 that is not my style. How many of us? How many of us? David said, uh -uh. that is not my style. I have my own that I'm comfortable in. Identity crisis has made us unable to reach the apogee of success. And so we are always at the mercy of people who will abuse us physically. People who will abuse us emotionally. People who will abuse us financially. Because we are miserable. Has your husband ever told you, Has your husband ever told you that? <laughs> Let me translate that. There's no way you're going. And you're frustrated. And he knows you. there's no way you're going because he's helping even your mother. And you're just there. And there's nothing for sure you can do. And there's no way you will go. Because you're miserable. It sounds so bad in my mother tongue. And you're there frustrated, abused, physically, emotionally, financially. There's no way you're going. The failure to know who we are has pushed us into all sorts of addictions including pornography, sexual addictions, masturbation, drug and substance abuse, name it. Because you don't know who you are. It has made us compare ourselves with others, including young couples who've just entered marriage. A woman wants her marriage to run the way the other woman's marriage runs. Said so they bought a V8. When you, what is wrong with you? Why can't you buy a V8 also? And a woman has a problem with her husband because the husband does not help out in the house and say, You see, Baba Nani scrubs the carpet and hangs it. You, you can't do anything. Comparison is the thief of all joy. Just be you 
and stop watching other people's life. You will do yourself a great favor if you watched your weight, watch your finances, watch your, your relationships. You better watch your fading airline and your dry skin instead of watching other people's lives. You're much better. Just be on your lane. Kila mutu lane yake. Mind your own business. When we come here to church, everybody mind your own word. Business. We are here to be transformed by Christ. Some of us could be so dirty. Thank God you, you're clean. But don't forget where you came from. You are dirtier than myself. So today Christ has just dusted you a little bit. You want to feel like you've arrived. Mind your own what? Business. But if you try coming to my lane, you try one day. Try one day. I will break your nose. Just try. Do not let identity crisis undress you. Don't. You know what? It is not all lost. Even with all that. There's still a reason to live. Because purpose is permanent. No one can take it from you. Moses kills an Egyptian, then flees to Midian and lives there as a fugitive. But his vision never dies. And 40 years later, he fulfills his purpose. Purpose is permanent. Your mistakes in life can never cancel the purpose for which God created you. No matter what your experiences are. You gave birth to a baby girl. The father is nowhere to be seen. It's a mistake, yes. But life still has to move on. With or without him. See, you have a brain. And you have both legs and hands. Move. You are still the child of God. In fact, God forgave you long before we rebaptized you. Romans 11.29 encourages me. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Not even God can revoke his gifts that he's given you. You can choose to pervert them, but he will never take it away from you. You will only be answerable when he comes back. And you, an account you must render for what you did with the gifts he gave you. You will. Beloved, purpose is resilient. It transforms mistakes into miracles and disappointments into testimonies. You need to be redressed. Find out your purpose in life. Maybe later this afternoon we will look at how to find out who you were born to be this afternoon. And when you begin to live out your purpose in life, your life will be barely unrecognizable. Hmm. Right now you're wondering why people are driving big cars. You're just on the edge of, you know, a cliff. Every time you want to jump and fly, you can't. Because of fear. And you're wondering why everybody else is flying. And you're always on the move. One, two, uh -uh. Let me first of all do my degree. Okay. One, two. Let me first of all get married. One, two. Let me get the first child. Two. Remember in Guinea? Three. My masters. And time is moving. You jump. You will jump. You will fly. Or if you don't fly, you will fall down. And when you fall down, it could be on a soft surface or even a hard one. But the truth is, you will always learn how to rise and move forward. Don't be afraid. Don't be. Understand that your work, your daily work, this which you are employed to do, or have employed yourself. Understand that that work is tied to your purpose. Go back and capture 
your dream. If you ever want to be fulfilled, go back to God. You need God the creator to find out your purpose. And it is through Jesus Christ, he will give you his spirit that will reveal to you your dream and your purpose. Beloved, when you have to dress yourself, you must deal with the bitterness and anger you have piled in many years. And you have to forgive, not just yourself, but even those who've hurt you. In fact, start with yourself. Say, Lisa, I forgive you for marrying Mokoro, if that is what I have to forgive myself for. For some of us, we were told, that man, my girl, that man, <laughs> but we were not seen. Today we are seeing. <laughs> and, and we are saying, I wish, I wish I just considered that signal. My mom told me. My mom saw it. It's too late. There's no reverse gear. You just have to move forward. Today in a marriage and you're wishing you married Steve. <laughs> of course not Nyaga. <laughs> but you're married to Eric. It's like, you're imagining how would life have been if I accepted Steve. There is no reverse gear. You must forgive yourself and put the past behind because your past does not belong to your present, not even your future. Let it go. Forgive others. There's, a, there's something I learned from Ahithophel. Those of you who know who Ahithophel is in the Bible. Ahithophel was a bitter man. And if you read the story carefully, it is bitterness that killed him. Beloved, bitterness will turn you into a foolish man or woman. It turned Ahithophel. Ahithophel, the Bible records, was one of the counselors of David. And when he gave a counsel, it was as if it came from the oracles of God. But when time came for Ahithophel to give advice to Absalom, who wanted to overthrow his father? Ahithophel gave the most stupid counsel because of bitterness. And he told Absalom, go and lie with your father's wives in the presence of all Israel. And Absalom did it. Why do you think Ahithophel was telling him that? Because Ahithophel is the father of Eliam. Eliam, who is the father of Bathsheba. And David had killed Uriah. But Sheba's husband, Ahithophel, was revenge. Bitterness makes you stupid. Bitterness, friends, will stagnate your life and ultimately it will kill you. It ended Ahithophel's life. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. And move forward. Appreciate your uniqueness. There is something that only you can do in this world. No one else. We are so many preachers. There is no preacher that preaches like me. I don't preach like pastor. Yeah. We are unique. There is something that only you can contribute to this race. Appreciate your uniqueness. Once you redress yourself, there is need to stay dressed. We are not market driven like some of us have been meant to believe. Someone was asking me two weeks ago, my son went to do I don't know which course. Now the university has asked him to change. So he's asking for advice. And a friend of mine was telling him, why don't you pick for him what is marketable today? Friends, we are not market driven. We are purpose driven. You did accounting because the market needed accountants. Today you're stuck. You're not moving. But accounting is still there. We are purpose driven. Because purpose instills the passion to act in life. 
life becomes significant life becomes relevant begin to live the dream that necessitated god to create you please contribute significantly to this life your greatest fear should not be death but you dying without leaving a footprint you dying without leaving a fingerprint that will will let the generations to come know that you are here dying we will die but you must leave your footprint have you gone to the university hostel someone has written i was here you must leave that footprint for your generation to know your descendants to know that you are here because purpose instills the passion to act in life that passion will lead you to professionalism professionalism will lead you to profits and you will become a blessing to others because you are blessed don't forget to care for yourself don't 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 love yourself it's called self care have a me time we are talking about staying dressed have some me time. Eat healthy. Visit some sauna. You call it a sauna or sauna. Whatever. Get a jacuzzi bath to massage your body. When was the last time you, you got a jacuzzi bath? You can't remember. When he was dating you, he told you, I've paid for your jacuzzi bath. You went, after you said I do, you've never seen it again. <laughs> you go yourself. Spend time with your friends. Travel the world. You could be lost. Depressed. You could be wasted, disoriented, frustrated, empty. But I want to tell you, you're still valuable. No child of God is too broken for the carpenter of Nazareth to repair. And when he repairs us, he does it perfectly. We look even better than the original. There's need to seek the lost valuable coin. There's need for us to turn the house upside down until we find it. I know there's a lost brother here. There could be a lost sister amidst us. They're looking useless. They could be looking irrelevant and even insignificant, but they are still valuable. They only need someone to affirm them, someone to offer emotional support, someone to offer encouragement that will rekindle the fire in them and move them from apathy to vibrancy. We can do this perfectly as a church through mentorship programs. Hold someone's hand, walk them that road. When a young woman comes to you that has slapped me for the first time, I'm thinking of quitting my marriage. Those things happen. Even with people who put on suits, it happens. Sabbath is a different day. The wardrobe never tells the story. But back in our homes, we are not happy. When a young woman comes and tells you, he slapped me for the first time, and you have a PhD, and you look at yourself in the mirror like, my PhD, you mean he slapped me with it? <laughs> yeah, he did, and he'll tell you, I will do it again. And you're thinking of quitting. Can a woman older hold your hand and tell you 
You don't need to quit. Walk that girl down that road. Some of these girls would wish to have a mother they don't have. Probably they are the first ones. Mommy died, daddy died. They are taking care of their siblings. They have to cry. They cannot go to their siblings. They need a woman to hold their hand and walk with her. A young man is just in marriage, cannot provide for his own, and the woman is threatening to leave. Say, but you are a man. Man up. What kind of man cannot even provide for his family? And for sure you're jobless. You just lost your job. You're not even seeing any, any job coming. My girls, we don't quit. You just shift into the driving seat is what it means to be a helpmeet. Helpmeet does not mean to wash dishes. No. He used to wash them before you came. Helpmeet means that the driver is tired. And they can get tired. They lose their jobs. They die. They always tell women, all women are potential widows. Your widows in the making. Widows in waiting. And if you don't learn to man up right now, you will not man up when he's no more. The time your husband is no more, you must be able to maintain the same standard of life or step it up. There is no reason it should come down because you have all that it takes. Can you provide for your family without the whole world knowing that your husband is jobless? You've just paid rent the other day and your mother and the whole village knows you paid rent. What? When were you paying for your, for, for our neighbor's children? You are paying for your own children. That when you buy supper, it must be refunded. Are you feeding someone else's kids? Can someone hold that man's hand and tell that man, this is how we man up. Or you think getting a richer man is better? Fine, go look for a sponsor. I want to see how far you will go. We can do this perfectly through mentorship programs. It's in mentorship that we are able to activate the value, to activate the worth that has been disabled. It's the devil's design that we are ignorant of our purpose because he delights in us perishing. God has made us co-laborers with him. And if we have been found beloved, we better join him in seeking the lost. Letting them know that they were created, they were made for greatness. That Jesus is concerned about their well-being. That Jesus cares that they should be happy. Someone just needs to hear that. Someone needs to hear that they are still the apple of God's eye. They are still special and indispensable. There's no one useless. Someone is asking as I finish. Give me one reason. One more reason. Why I should continue living. Our identity in God far outweighs our identity in our purpose of existence. Because in God the Father, we have our belongingness. We are his children. In God the Son, we have our worth. We are worth his precious blood. And in God the Holy Spirit, we have our enablement. Now to him who is able to do much more exceedingly and abundantly than what you think or ask according to the power that is in us. For the woman that lost her coin, her marriage was at stake. Christ is represented by that woman. We are the coin and eternity 
is at stake. He has to seek us diligently. Because in his father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, he would have told us. And he went to prepare a place for us. And he will come again and receive us to himself. That where he is, there we may be also. He just can't afford to lose you. He cares more than you ever thought. And I love the words of that song. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long night's dreary, I know my Savior can. Help me sing it in Luo. Nice. Eorita mano adir kujuyo namulo chu. May the Lord bless you in his name. Amen. Praise God for that's an inspiring uh, presentation. We'll close our service with the song number 373. 373 in the SDA hymnal. Indeed, because Christ cares, he came to seek and save the lost. Let's all rise and do song 373, Seeking the Lost, Seeking the Lost. The stanzas will take it fast, then when it comes to the refrain, it will be a bit slow. So let's sing. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray, follow me, come unto me, his message in pity. Words of the Master speaking today, going afar upon the mountain, bringing the one back again into the fold. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus so that we can hurt the soul, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. All the men going afar upon the mountain. Bringing the one and draw back again. 
again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the love for sinners slain. Thus I will go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way, going afar upon fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the love for sinners slain. Creator of the universe and all that is in it. We glorify your name because your creation is perfect. You have created us with a dream in your heart. It's our desire that we'll know what necessitated our best. To be able to live a purpose-driven life. To be able to bless others and even fund mission of the church. Jehovah God, you have put in our sin built abilities to become who we were born to be. But life has eroded it. We don't even understand ourselves anymore. Some of us feel wasted. Some of us feel useless. Some of us feel depressed, rejected. We struggle with so many things and we have no reason to move on. Father, speak to each one at a very personal level. Even as you reveal yourself unto us in a very special way. May your child who's here walk out of this house feeling revived, refreshed, and energized to move on with life. Because you've never forsaken us. You've always held our hands. We glorify your name for who you are. And we thank you for the fact that, Lord, we serve a mighty God. There is nothing impossible with you. It's our prayer, this service, that when we'll come to the end of it, it will be indeed a delight in our lives. And even as we rest on this day, may we find true rest in you, Jesus. Let us go home saying it was wonderful. It was nice to be in the house of the Lord. May your name be glorified as we have a short break to come back. Jehovah God, do not let your presence depart from us. This is our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's arise. Song number 214. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. A flat. We have this hope. Let's sing. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts. Faith in the promise of Time is here when 
the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing hallelujah christ is king we have this hope that bonds within our hearts hope in the coming of the lord we are united in jesus christ our lord we are united in his love love for the waiting people of the world people who need a savior's love soon the heavens will open wide christ will come to claim his bride all the universe will sing hallelujah Christ is King. We have this hope, this faith, and God's great love. We are united in Christ. Before we leave, just to remind us, the afternoon, the program continues. Let's go take our lunch and be back in time. It all bless you as you share your meals.